Good morning, everyone, and welcome to session two of the senior management <laughs> training uh, for ISCED. Um, today, we are doing a follow on from uh, week one. Neil was with us last week, and he gave us a general int in introduction as to the strategic importance of the whole online learning environment and how you guys are strategically placed to take advantage of this. And we think it's very exciting. Um, the rest of the program is going to start delving into specific aspects of online learning. So for today, for example, we're going to be looking at course design and assessment and quality assurance. We're going to talk about uh, specific things that are relevant for the online space. And um, yeah. I, I say we, because we are actually- Ah, see, see, simple message can turn on that too. Let's mute some people here. Uh, okay, mute all. All right, so um, the we, uh, each week then we're gonna look at a, a, a different aspect of uh, online learning and then what are the implications for management? Uh, uh, what do you need to put in place in order for the institution to excel and for students to be successful as learners? So um, we will be doing uh, that. The um, Today's program, let me just get this going. Today's program, we go, uh, have a little welcome. I see uh, Wisdom's joined us. I, I'm gonna give him a few moments just to um, uh, talk to you, but then we're going to be looking specifically at um, course and program design, and then I'm going to ask uh, Ephraim to actually look into the quality assurance, and I see he's, um, he's very passionate about the role of assessment in that uh, session. So uh, that's going to be our little program for today. Uh, this online session, the synchronous session, uh, is to set the scene and to give you some, uh, some food for thought, but the real meat of the training is in the Moodle. It's in the ISCED learning platform. And again, we've laid out some resources and given you some activities to engage with uh, during the week. I've had a, a look in last week's uh, session. I'm glad to see that everyone, uh, Everyone but one person went into the system and started to engage with the various uh, uh, resources and activities. We would strongly encourage you to use those resources. The real training is not in listening to Ephraim and I or Neil, blah, blah, yada, yada on. Uh, the real thing is thinking about what are the implications for ISCED and you guys are in a much better position than we are to answer those type of questions. We can, we can alert you to what are the questions, but the answers lie with you. All right, so we would strongly encourage you to find time each week to engage with those additional resources and to think on the issues that are raised in the forums, et cetera. All right, so for today, I'm gonna to handle the section on course and program design and Ephraim will take on the quality assurance uh, in a moment. Are there any questions at the moment uh, that needs to be answered? Um, I'm dying to know if the PowerPoint Portuguese translation is is useful or not or is it just a load of rubbish that's coming up on the screen what do people think? I think it's very useful ah so we got one vote for very useful so should we keep it going does it is it worth yeah, it? yeah I hope this is very helpful okay. yes it's good enough it's good yeah, enough to get you the gist stay eh? yeah all right, then we'll keep that going. Uh, Ephraim, if it drops off for some reason, just alert me, because then I have to re-engage it. it uh, last week, it kept having a rest. Okay. All right. So it could be argued that at the core of a successful education institution is the quality of its programs. All right. In the end, um, that is at the heart, or that is the core of what we're trying to achieve. Um, you could argue that, oh, no, no, it's the learning that takes place, and that I take that as a given. But the learning is facilitated by the program and the materials and the way that you have uh, organized the education. So uh, being that as it may then, there are a few things we need to think about in terms of our course designs and our program designs if we are going to be doing it 
yeah, in an online environment. So this next slide then, what we, what I'm trying to show you is that if we try and answer the it's a very, it sounds simple, the simple question, how do we learn? Then I'm afraid there is no one answer. And the scholarship on, on learning theory is enormous and very diverse. And you can see the diagram on the right hand side there is someone has attempted, his name is Millwood, has attempted to map out what are the predominantly popular and significant learning theories. And I'm afraid you can see there's tons of them. Um, if you have come from an education background, you might be aware of the major paradigms of uh, behaviorism and constructivism and cognitivism. And even now we're talking about connectivism and all those isms. And I'm afraid that there is merit in all of those. Um, it's not like you can just choose one. The, the reality is that it's probably, uh, it needs to, you need to take the very best from each of these different perspectives and actually mold it together to something that is useful uh, for the ISCED. Um, uh, the, even some of the most fav famous theorists, again, are quite diverse with Brunner and, and Piaget and all of these characters. It's, it's a very fascinating field. And if you have time, we would encourage you to go and have a look into some of these ideas. But for you guys, it's not like you're going to be designing the learning. Your, your role is to manage the design of the courses and so on. So I, I've tried to put together there the idea that numerous theories from numerous different perspectives and theorists, but there does appear to be some consensus. So. If you were to then amalgamate the messages from all the various different theories and paradigms, then uh, certain elements begin to emerge. And these are just as important in e-learning or online learning as in education in general. So these will be universal issues, um, universal principles. So I've extracted four. I'm a champion of these four principles. And I would say if your programs and your courses hits these four ideas and um, find a way for them to be manifest in the various programs and activities and things, then you're on the right track. Um, let me just admit some people. They're all waiting to come in. I'm just gonna admit them in. Okay. And so what are my four, four key takeaways? Uh, if you did look at that enormous field of learning theory, uh, what are the key takeaways? So one of the things we're, we're beginning to appreciate now and is becoming very popular is that um, learning should not be passive. The, what we've been doing in the past, our very didactic style of teaching, is that we tend to put a professor up front and then he espouses wisdom and then we hope some of it sticks to the students and then we set an exam for them uh, and we want to see how much has stuck with the students. I'm afraid we now realize that is a very inefficient way of learning and um, has amazingly low retention rates. So um, we would now argue that for learning to be effective, your programs need to have a high number of activities, well not a high number, an appropriate number of student activities whereby they actually get to do something. So I've said there, activity-based learning is a learning style that requires the students to do. We suggest reducing the number of lectures, an example of passive learning, and include activities where the students learn by applying, evaluating, interpreting, their new knowledge and using their new skills. So the whole idea then is um, when you are asking for new programs to be designed, then uh, you say, right, so what is the percentage of student activities involved here? Or is it purely exposition? If a course is nearly all exposition, it's on a wicket to failure. All right, and uh, we've got to try and get away from that idea. Then the next thing that is popping up 
uh, and it's becoming quite commonly championed by all these different theories is that the student needs to be have a level of engagement. Uh, they need to be have some agency in their learning process. Uh, to believe that learning takes place because a professor is lecturing is rubbish. The learning takes place in the student's head. All right, so how do we make sure that the students are engaged and involved in this learning process? And the, one of the ways that keeps coming through is that students need to feel that they have agency that they are responsible for their learning, that they can influence the way things work. So we would say that the second principle that you should champion in your courses is that they should be student-centered as much as possible. In Africa, this is a serious problem. We are so entrenched in very traditional pedagogies, particularly the didactic mode of teaching, that uh, we've, we've allowed it to become predominant. It pervades everything that we offer. And yet it is so, such a poor way to uh, 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 bring about effective learning. Despite a long history of lecture-based education, where the focus is on the teacher, education research advocates adding opportunities for students to be at the center of the learning. They should have autonomy and be aware of their responsibility to shape how learning happens. All right, so uh, quite interestingly, a lot of students resist this, okay? They, um, what's happened is we are now saying that they must become more responsible and they don't like that. They quite like the idea of just being spoon fed stuff and trying to memorize something, some comprehension for an end of year exam. And they, that's, they find that easier to get the the certificate, but it doesn't mean that they have become good practitioners in their fields. They are just memorized stuff and therefore you've got to get them over, the, over this issue as well. The third item I'd like to champion um, is we are finding that in many ways, traditional academia has done a disservice to most of their graduates in the sense that we keep going on about individual attainment. Uh, we make them uh, study on their own. We make them do exams on their own. We give them an individualized report, et cetera. And then we push them out into the real world. And so many of the skills that they will require once they are working in the professional world are just, they're not prepared. They just don't have them. For example, working in a team, intra, intrapersonal and interpersonal uh, skill sets, uh, etc. The ability to negotiate and to compromise and to all these things which would happen in a collaborative environment, they just have had no experience. So one of the things we're saying then is collaboration not only improves the learning process, it provides them with a number of skills uh, which they will need in life. Students learn best when they interact socially and have access to networks of information and different perspectives. Professionally, students will need to function in teams, yet we rarely encourage the acquisition of social and inter intrapersonal skills in traditional academia. We should create opportunities for students to collaborate. All right, is number three. And then what we're also just finding, uh, the research is showing, is that the more our courses are embedded in context, then the more real they become and the more engaging uh, they are to students. So for example, um, let me just let some more people in. So for example, um, when ISCD is creating their courses, they shouldn't really be pure subjects. They should really be contextualized specifically for the environment that the students will find themselves working in. So in your case, Mozambique, and maybe even northern Mozambique uh, particularly, what do these concepts and abstract terms mean in reality in that context? And so therefore, we're saying that a lot of these programs need to acknowledge the context in which they will be applied and they will be used. So those are my, our four 
design principles that when people are crafting courses, those four items should be paramount, should be very clear in the design process. All right. Um, All right, so this next screen then is once you've decided to adopt a set of principles, I've, we've given you four, but there are, there are lots, um, but I think those four are at the core. Then you've got to decide, so how do you actually implement those four principles? So we would say rather than getting going, uh, uh, starting from scratch and just trying to work out a method, the, there are some learning design models, which I can, uh, they, I think there are many. But, and again, I've had to make a little um, selection of some that I found useful in the past. Maybe again, some more research to find out which learning design model works specifically either for a specific subject or for the types of people that you are engaging with. But what I'm trying to really encourage you to do then is make sure that your designers and the people that you employ to create these courses um, actually have a model that they try and pin all those principles and all the subject content uh, into. Um, so how do you organize the learning process? Um, and I'll go through the three models in a moment that I've got here for you. But I would say the thing we've got to get away from is a lecture, some attempt at discussion. In the old days, we used to have a tutorial and then they would either write a paper or do an exam. Okay, I think we've got to get away from a course design that keeps using that particular model. Um, that's not to say that you can escape exit exams and things like that. I'm sure a lot of it is legislated in, in how you have to put, um, uh, perform as a higher education institution, but there's no reason why you can't have the rest of your, um, your course designs that implement uh, various models. Okay. So the um, the one on the screen, I'll wait to flicks over to this one. Right. So we're going to have a quick look at the nine events of instruction. Uh, the theorist here, his name was Gane or Gagne, and he basically said that every learning intervention should have these nine steps. And they go from gaining attention, being very clear about your objectives, um, recalling prior knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. And then he would argue then that the idea is if you've got those nine steps in place, then it's more likely that learning will be effective. All right. The next one on the screen is ARCs. This, this goes for at another approach. It says students need to be satisfied, have their attention um, captured. They need to then um, have the ability to, uh, oh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with these these animations is I've lost my picture. Okay, so those are the nine Gagne's nine. The next one, uh, which we'll talk about, is Merrill in a moment. I'll come back to him. So the arcs one is about how do you motivate students? So it's built on a motivation model. It says, first of all, gain their attention. Make sure the work that you're doing is relevant, that you incite confidence in them, and then you provide them with some type of satisfaction that they have attained. So that's the second model you can encourage your designers to use is the ARCS motivational model. Um, I'm not gonna go into any detail. I don't think it's your, your mandate is to do this, but I think it needs to be clear that they need some type of model to hang what they're designing on. And then the third one is Merrill's um, first principles of instruction. He says you should have a task or a problem and then um, get them to work around this particular problem, that they, you should activate their interest, that you should then demonstrate a process to solve the problem, but then give them an opportunity to practice and then finally to implement the process. So if, we could, if you could design your course using that type of model, then you're more likely to hit those four principles that we mentioned earlier. All right, so what have I said so far? Lots of theory, there is some consensus, there should be four principles, at least four principles that you champion in your designs. I've gone for um, uh, student uh, activity-based, um, student-centered, 
that there should be levels of collaboration and that there should be contextually relevant. And then I said, in order to make sure that all those principles hold together, you should really have some type of a learning design model. All right. So what does this mean for online? Because you are principally an, uh, uh, an online institution. Your courses have to run online. So how do those models translate into, just letting some more people in. Um, how does that translate, those, those models translate to online? So um, we need to be aware that online is both wonderful and terrible. Okay, so the, the belief that e-learning is sexy is not true. E-learning is special, but it's not necessarily an easy environment to learn in. Why? Is number one, many students feel isolated. One of the benefits of the face-to-face -face institution was the fact that there was always peer support. They could always talk to their mates, uh, get notes, get advice. Um, if they'd missed something, they could catch up, et cetera, et cetera. When they were learning online, they are very much mediated by the technology and, and many of them feel isolated and sometimes can get lost. And that's one of the reasons for high attrition rates for e-learning is because they're not designed well and the students don't feel there's sufficient support for them. All right. Um, when you are designing your course, then um, you've got to keep in mind then that another problem is access. All right, first of all, access to a digital device. Now I know ISCED builds in the cost of their tablet into the pricing, which I think is excellent. I think it's great. I don't know if it works, you'll have to tell me, but uh, it's really cool. And same with connectivity in South Africa, some of the courses we're doing now, uh, we're having to actually provide data, uh, data bundles uh, in order for the the participants to engage. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, often we save on catering and we save on hiring a venue and so on and so on. So we just offset uh, this costs of data with, um, uh, uh, offset the cost of data from what we've saved. Um, the course materials for being online, even more, they need to be more uh, very contextually relevant. Now you've got to worry about language. You've got to worry about um, uh, are you is your message getting across? Um, is there a barrier? Are we using resources which are uh, either too high in bandwidth or, uh, or maybe it's a video with a strange accent, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to be very careful that our courses really are contextualized and aligned specifically to the, uh, the sensibilities of our students. Um, opportunities for student agency is all too easy to just go and uh, emulate what we've done before in terms of lectures. Now we're Zooming instead of a lecture and uh, we've got to make sure that we design our online experience so that it pro has levels of student agency. Um, I was talking about activity-based learning. Um, it's even more, more important now because we need evidence when we're online that learning is taking place. And just people watching a video is not an example of learning. So we need to have the appropriate number of activities whereby we don't overwhelm faculty. But at the same time, we have sufficient evidence that the students are engaging with the materials and thinking about them in a deep, deeper way. Um, uh, online as well. We've got to find ways to make sure that there are opportunities for students to engage with their peers. So maybe we need WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups that run in parallel to our courses in order to make sure that there's lots of engagement. That was one of the problems with online is that they feel isolated. So we've got to find ways to make sure that they engage properly. Uh, at the moment, uh, if you look at a lot of courses online, they are merely people's lecture notes posted up there with a, sometimes a little video. And I'm afraid it's just too deathly boring. All right. And a lot of people lose interest and, are, um, uh, and so on. All right. So we've got to make sure that we balance our text based uh, materials with sufficient uh, multimedia 
uh, in order to make it richer. And we need to be a little bit careful that we don't offset, that we don't create all these resources which no one can access because of low bandwidth. So we've got to find the sweet spot between um, uh, some multimedia and some uh, text-based materials. And finally, another big problem with online learning and the online courses is that there's no technical support or very little technical support. So we've got to find ways to build that into the course design as well. Where do they go when they want academic support? Where do they go when they want technical support, etc.? All right. So once you have worked out what is the combination of all these factors and how do they work? How do you then produce or create the actual online course? So there are, I'm just going to look at two very quick production cycles. The most famous one is ADI or um, AD, um, but basically it's an acronym for uh, do an analysis, uh, then do the design, then develop, then implement, and finally um, do it some type of an evaluation. So uh, that's, you can see on the screen at the moment, analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And under design would be where your learning models, your learning design models would fit. However, a lot of people complain that Eddy is very expensive and very protractive, and it takes a very long time for it to do a whole cycle. Um, and yet uh, you don't even know if your course is any good. So Sam is another, uh, development model, successive approximation model. This one calls for very quick iterations. So it's still very similar to Eddy in the sense that you do an analysis, you then uh, create a uh, design and create a little prototype and then you evaluate if it's any good, but then you would repeat that. Those are iterations as many times as necessary until you re refined the whole course carefully. We uh, At MBA, we tend to prefer SAM uh, we like to have lots of opportunities to go back and fix, go back and fix, and then uh, uh, and inform the next cycle. So that by the time you're on your fourth cycle, uh, it doesn't necessarily look like the product that you had created at the end of the first cycle. All right, so keep that in mind then. I'm nearly running out of time. So what does this mean in terms of management? So number one is that you can't nowadays just say to a content expert, create us a course. All right, uh, we want a course for online, uh, go make us one. And then he just churns out some content and maybe a little video. All right, that's just doesn't cut it anymore. So now what we need is, yes, we still need our content experts, but now they're part of a team. All right, so the content expert would be someone who knows the, the discipline, uh, uh, is very familiar and understands what the issues are. And then they're the ones who can develop, develop the content and the activities and so on. But then in this day and age, and especially in an institution like ISED, you now need to have some access to instructional designers. It's people who will then say, okay, but this won't work like this online. It's, it's deathly. Uh, we've got to have, uh, introduce those principles. We've got to introduce those learning design models, and we've got to use those uh, production cycles. So an instructional designer will help uh, mold the whole process. But then they themselves rarely have all the skills. So you probably will still need some media specialists, people who will um, start creating the graphics and the animations and the simulations and the video content, et cetera. They tend to be very techy and you've got to be a little bit careful that they don't take over the shop. Otherwise, I'll just turn everything into little bits and pieces. That's why you need your content expert and your instructional designer to work closely with the media specialists. And then one thing that I, I do believe ISED is doing is that they are using a facilitation approach, which means there is support, there is help, uh, academic and technical online. And I think um, you can develop standalone online courses, but if you want a high through rate of your, your students successfully exiting the system, then you need some effective, and I've put their caring facilitation. Uh, one of my experiences when I did come to do training with you guys some years back was that your facilitators were very brusque. <laughs> they were very quite nasty to the people who were phoning in. So I, I'm thinking then it's got to be a nurturing, it's got to be caring, it's got to be supportive. 
their job is to make sure that as many stay in the system as possible and successfully exit the system. So, yeah. And then obviously you need a platform administrator, someone who's the technical person looking after the platform. In your case, it's Moodle. Um, you want that to be up to date. You want it to have all the latest bells and whistles and you want it to have to be secure. So you've got to have all the security patches. It's got to have the, uh, the latest upgrades uh, and it's got to be up 24 seven. It may never go down. All right. Off of online learning. If the, if your server is down, your university is closed. All right. And the, the beauty of online learning is that they should never be closed. All right. So, um, uh, quickly in terms of costs. All right. Um, if you were to take all of the things I've said and then put it into context, then it means that uh, initially when you're developing a new program, your costs are quite high. You've got quite a big team involved in all the various bits and pieces. But the beauty of these online courses is that over time, uh, they become more cost effective. So there's an initial outlay uh, of cost, um, but then it's very easy to revise and to um, update and uh, in the future, so you can rework the same courses for many years to come by tweaking them as time goes by until your curriculum has changed and you need to change it completely. All right, so keep that in. I've got that's my third point is that these courses tend to be dynamic and they do allow updates and rev easy revisions. And then another thing we, I've noticed uh, that I am uh, often confronted with is there's a lot of time in the design process a lot of agony about how these courses actually work and how they fit together. But then there's, they haven't allocated enough time for production. So production is actually the most, is the longest of the, of the whole design and development process. And it needs to be, uh, they need to be given sufficient time to actually uh, build and create and upload all these bits and pieces. So just keep that in mind as well. All right, so how do you cost a course? All right, so um, I'll, I'll just quickly give you some ideas. How big is your course? What's the size? What's the number of notional hours? What is your modality? <coughs> is it purely online? Is it face-to-face? -face? Is it a combination, a blend of these two? According to which modality you choose, there are different types of costs involved. Uh, design and development team composition. How many of these people have you got in-house? How many people are you going to have to bring in from outside in order to uh, uh, create the, uh, the design? We've mentioned content experts, structural designers, multimedia specialists, platform administrators, translators, facilitators, etc., etc. So you have to work that out. How much multimedia are you going to use? Now, if you're in a bandwidth poor area, then obviously you want to go a little bit easy on your multimedia, but you do want some, you want it to pop. All right. So you want a little bit. So how much is required? Video and uh, is quite expensive to develop. Um, audio is much cheaper. If you want to go for simulations, those are extremely expensive to, to, to build. All right. So uh, you've got to do a little audit of what multimedia you need. Are there any OERs available, open educational resources? Because these are free. And uh, if they align with what you have designed, then this is a good cost cutting way forward. Uh, you need to do an audit to work out are there existing OERs which will allow us to use them and to adapt them to fit? And if so, where are they so that the uh, production people can adapt them? Um, is it a facilitated or an independent study course? All right. And then again, um, if it's facilitated, you got to kind of factor in their time. Uh, their costs, etc. Uh, and then finally, the platform. Uh, is there any specialized software or any specialized plugins that are required for this um, course? Um, if it's, uh, for example, I'm working with agricultural economists, um, uh, part of the AERC, and uh, they keep using SS. SSRP is their, uh, it's their statistical package. So we have to keep working out what are the subscriptions for that. Uh, and so on and so on. So keep the, all those platform costs in mind as well. All right, sorry, I went very fast. Um, it's, uh, it's not your job to design and build, but you need to be aware of what's involved uh, when you are uh, thinking about these particular 
uh, courses. Um, all right. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to hold questions over. If you would like to ask me questions, you can do it in the chat now. And then uh, Ephraim is going to pick up on quality assurance and assessment. And um, I can answer questions to me in the chat. So if you've things I said there and you went, oh yeah, I don't get that or I need more on this. Can you do it in the chat now? And I'm going to ask Ephraim to uh, take us through the next few slides. Uh, Ephraim, you're going to have to tell me when to hit the to hit the next slide for you. Okay, Andrew, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, this this part of the, this session is actually picking from the quality assurance audit report, and you will notice that in that report. I flagged something under uh, online assessment based on the findings of the audit process. And the recommendation is actually about making improvements in terms of the assessment processes that we have and that we administer online. Andrew is right in saying that um, a good online institution should develop or design good courses Courses that have contextual relevance. The same applies to assessment processes. Credible assessment should be based on appropriate design, should be valid, should be reliable, and should have a lot of integrity. And that's, and that's what, what makes assessment, assessment processes, processes in an institution good enough. enough. So, so in, in the report, report I say the quality, um, I underline the importance of the rigor of online assessment. assessment. One of the things that we are often criticized about as online providers is the assessment system that we use. People argue that we really don't test high level cognitive skills. Because a lot of our online tests consist of multiple choice type of questions that simply require students to recall or remember content. And they don't really test a high level cognitive skills. So we, we really need address that aspect of our online assessment processes to ensure that there is sufficient rigor. You will notice that there's a general shift in many good institutions from once of terminal examinations towards the adoption of uh, a variety of formative assessments and those kinds of assessments that encourage students to actually demonstrate what I call here worthwhile knowledge and skills. Worthwhile in the sense that it is the kind of knowledge, they are the kind of skills students can apply in real life in order to solve real problems in life in general or at workplaces. So we need to ensure that um, our the design of our learning activities in our courses is authentic enough. In other words, we have authentic learning activities, activities that relate to real life, but we also design authentic assessment tasks, the kinds of assessment tasks that equip students with knowledge and skills that enable them to apply in real life. So students must demonstrate their ability to do that through those forms of assessment. Next slide, Andrew. I, I do ask that question, um, does assessment really facilitate or constrain learning? I think it's a key question that we should always ask ourselves. And, and, and the argument is that if done properly, assessment actually can improve the learning processes. It can shape the behavior of learners and we can be able to be accountable enough as higher education institutions. But, but often assessment can also be a 
source of uh, a lot of frustrations and anxiety. I think you might have experienced it with your students. Students get very anxious when it comes to uh, assessment, especially end of year examinations. It's almost like a punishment. They, they dislike examinations because of the way they see them, because of the way perhaps we administer them, and perhaps because of the purpose for which they are meant, right? So key questions I think that we should always ask ourselves are, does the assessment assess the right things? Are we really addressing the right things? Is asking a student to remember the content they dealt with in a course enough? Is it the right thing to do, right? Is it getting the best from the learners that we have? Do our assessment processes help us get the best out of our learners? Does it take place at the right point, at the right stage in the learning process? Is it susceptible to cheating? Does it involve a sustainable workload on the part of our learners in order to avoid burnout? Next slide, Andrew. So we, we really need to rethink approaches to assessment, especially online assessment, given that we have new technology enabled tools that we can draw upon in order to improve not only the variety, but even the quality of our assessment processes. Given the new challenges that are emerging about security issues, about academic integrity generally, and given the new ways of delivering programs that we now have as a result of the, the availability of all these um, technological tools, but also as a result of the preferences of the new kind of student that we are dealing with these days and the common and preferred modes of delivery that are becoming more and more uh, common in many institutions. E-learning you are using is, is just one of them, right? What, what do your students, e-learning students prefer in terms of assessment? Do they prefer to come to a common place and write examinations there? Do they prefer to write tests under strictly supervised conditions? Or do they prefer to have something that is more flexible where they can log in as and when they are ready and they can be able to do a task, an assessment task? And so, yes, there are all these changes that are happening in terms of uh, learning strategies, in terms of uh, use of technology, and in terms of uh, student preferences. We need to take this into account in designing our learning processes as well as our assessment processes. The next slide, Andrew. From my own perspective, the big shift actually in terms of assessment has to do with enabling improved learning rather than simply assessing whether or not a student can recall and recount what was presented. In other words, I would, I would emphasize assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning, which we have prioritized as institutions before. I'm not, I'm not arguing that we should completely do away with assessment of learning. We need to have that, but I think we should also prioritize assessment for learning. Use assessment processes in order to enhance the quality of learning by the student. So what it means is our assessment processes should happen throughout the course of learning, not just right at the end, and should actually be meant to identify weaknesses within our students, even weaknesses within ourselves as providers, as facilitators. And then we bring in corrective measures early enough so our students can be able to, to benefit from the learning processes. So yes, I, I really do uh, uh, um, encourage assessment uh, for purposes of learning. I do give uh, um, um, that, that link there. This shift towards assessment for learning is supported by the widespread use of adaptive learning engines. That, 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 that link will take you to a very important resource, which you can see there 
And that resource I thought would be very useful in terms of generating ideas amongst yourselves on how best you can be able to administer effective e-assessment in the various of your programs. You will see that in that resource, there are a whole lot of examples or case studies that are given of various institutions, some of, the, some of them really leading institutions internationally that are using different forms of e-assessment. So you will find there are examples of institution using institutions using automated feedback and grading. There are a lot of institutions using intelligent tutoring systems. A lot of institutions using learning analytics actually to draw on teaching and learning data in order to identify um, at-risk students and then bring in uh, supportive measures timely enough in order to improve uh, their graduation or throughput rates. There are examples of institutions that are using adaptive, adaptive group formations as well as online proctoring tools. So I thought it would be quite a good resource for you to look at, go through and see what you can draw from it as you try to improve on your e-assessment processes. Next slide, Andrew. So yes, uh, there are various ways in which um, good institutions are changing their assessment processes. We have automated marking of student assignments, in fact, including essays, the marking of essays. And you will see from the examples in that uh, uh, resource that I've just referred you to, how some institutions are doing that and the kinds of uh, technologies that are used to mark uh, uh, essays. Video-based forms of assessment, assessment of real student competencies that they've, uh, that they've mastered. Peer-to-peer -peer assessment, which is actually becoming very popular and use of e-portfolios. You also have things like open book examinations, right? So it's a whole range of uh, these e-assessment strategies that institutions are using. Um, and you are, you are, I think, advised to look at them and see what you can draw from them. The next one, Andrew, I sometimes forget Andrew and I try to push on my laptop. <laughs> So one of the things that I emphasize in terms of assessment is creating what we call authentic assessments. And that these come directly from what Andrew was explaining about the designing of learning activities, appropriate learning activities, activities that require students to apply, activities that require students to see the relevance within context, the relevance of learning within context, right? So in terms of your assessment tasks, you also have to make them as authentic as possible. So people ask, what is uh, authentic assessment? And I say, it is, a, it is a form of assessment in which learners are asked to perform real world tasks that demonstrate meaningful application of essential knowledge and skills. In other words, the knowledge they have learned through their courses, the, the skills they've acquired must find a way of being applied in a real world situation in order to solve real world problems. And in your assessment task, you want to ensure that you test your student on their ability to actually solve those problems, not just to remember the knowledge. So the task is contextualized, try to contextualize the assessment task, give like a scenario within a Mozambican context. And once you contextualize your tasks that way, it enables your learners to demonstrate their competencies in a more authentic setting, in a more realistic setting. So an authentic assessment usually includes a task for learners to perform and to be fair enough, give your students a rubric, show them how you are going to score them on their, on their assignment, right? And, and, and your students should always have an idea of uh, which part of the answer is going to have so many marks. What is the marker going to be looking for in my, in my answer to the assignment? And so 
once they know in advance, they can also be able to commit enough time, enough effort to the relevant aspects of the assignment. Next, next um, slide. I, I, I try to clarify this concept of authentic assessment by kind of comparing it with the traditional forms of assessment. The traditional forms of assessment like tests, like end of year examinations are usually designed to take a snapshot of what the learner knows or what the learner remembers at a particular point in time. And often what I, what, what, what my experience is that students who have good memory, who can easily remember the content actually score the highest marks. And they are not necessarily the brightest, neither are they the best in terms of being able to actually perform tasks out there. They simply score high marks because they are good at remembering. The authentic assessment task involves the learner in, in, in work that makes learning more meaningful and builds on the learner's present knowledge and skills. The knowledge the learner has, the skills the learner has mastered, which they are able to apply in real life, actually become part of them. It, they, can, they can hardly forget them because they know within a particular context where there's a particular problem, they know what to draw on in order to be able to address that problem. So actually, it is an important aspect of knowledge building in learners to be able to get learners to deal with authentic assessment tasks that require them to address real life problems. Next slide, Andrew. So yes, I tried to make that uh, neat comparison. It's, it's not that neat, but I think it will give a sense of the difference between the two forms of assessment. And I say in traditional uh, assessment, you actually have the student selecting a response, but in authentic assessment, the student performs a task. Traditional assessment tasks tend to be contrived, you know, Whereas authentic assessment tasks are real life tasks. They are life-based tasks. In traditional assessment, you, you focus on recall, you focus on recognition, you focus on remembering, you focus on, on the knowledge aspect. In authentic assessment, you focus on construction, you focus on application, right? You actually focus on doing things on the part of the student. Traditional assessment is teacher structured, whereas authentic assessment is largely learner structured. And in traditional assessment, you are looking for kind of indirect evidence, right, through the knowledge that you taste. And the assumption you make is that if the student knows this content, the student will be able to do A, B, C, D, in life. So the, the, the assessment is actually looking for indirect evidence in traditional assessment. But in authentic assessment, you are actually looking for direct evidence because you are asking the student to use knowledge but to solve a particular problem. So you are actually looking at the ability of the student to address, to solve that real life problem. So you are looking for direct evidence to do something. Next slide, Andrew. So yes, I, th I think I try to summarize uh, that form of assessment uh, in, the, in that, in that uh, slide. Authentic assessment involves students providing responses to a challenge, to a question, or to a problem that is very realistic. In other words, realistic in the sense of it being uh, life-based, real world-based. It requires judgment. It requires innovation. It requires creativity on the part of the student. You actually ask the student to do the subject. It replicates or it simulates context in which adults are tested in the workplace, in civic life, and in one's personal life. Can one be able to know how to use whatever knowledge they've gained through a course in their personal life? under particular circumstances, when they face a particular problem. 
Authentic assessment assesses the student's ability to efficiently and effectively use knowledge and skills to negotiate a complex task and allows appropriate opportunities to release, to practice, to consult resources and get feedback on and refine performance. In fact, that's part of the reason why you find open book tests and open book examinations are, are quite popular in, um, in, in authentic assessment because the student can, can actually consult resources, but the nature of the question is such that they don't just rely on the, they don't just give back the knowledge they get from the book they consult. They actually have to find a way of using it. So what is being assessed actually is the use of that knowledge. Consult, yes, and get that knowledge, but let's see your ability to be able to use that knowledge, okay? Next slide, Andrew. I do end by giving you um, um, some kind of a quiz. How is this quiz structured, Andrew? Do people have to go out or they can just uh, uh, do, do it? it. Um, let me just and check, please. is there a poll on here? Uh, no, I think we can just get people to, because uh, the answers are true or false. So yeah. yeah. So I think we'll just ask people to write it in the chat. Do they go for true or do they go for false? So we'll just add them up to see which is the the biggest. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. So, so just, just do, do those eight, eight questions, questions and, and write, write it in the chat space. space. Well, no, let's do it one at a time. And then, uh, so we can get all the answers. So uh, okay. first first one. One. yeah, so formative Form assessments provide assessment. support for learning and teaching. Do you believe this is true or false? And can you put it in the chat now, a T or an F? Okay, okay I, I see, see T, 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 two, two of them there. Come, we need more, we've got three, come, we need all of you. You've got to do it quick. You've got like 10 <laughs> seconds. So get your chat up, make sure you're ready. Okay, here they come. All right, looking like yeah, we've got a trend see. emerging. Uh, Ephraim, it looks like people are going for true. That, that seems, seems to be the trend, trend. yes. yes. Okay. okay, keep, 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 keep your, your answer, answer somewhere. somewhere. Let's go, go on to the, the second, second one. one. All right, summative assessments are part of a wider assessment strategy, including formative assessment throughout a course. Is that true or is that false? Okay, I, I see TTT coming, coming up there. there. Mm -hmm. You're only getting five or six out of 32. Come, people, you've got to be <laughs> quick, and you only have 10 seconds to answer. <laughs> Ten, 10 seconds, seconds to be aggressive. Aggressive. All right, so we're getting a definite trend for T. Do you want to talk to it? Or do you right. want us to do the next one? Let's, Let's go, go on, on to the, the next, next one. one. Three. One example of a summative assessment is a paper drafted over a number of weeks incorporating feedback from a teacher. Is that true or is that false? Let's get, Let's get some, some more. Got some T's. Oh, you got one F. Yes, yes I, I can, can see, see one F. F. Okay, okay, let's, let's go, go get on, on to the, the next, next one. one. All right, so stop posting for three. The next one is for four. Is formative assessment never carry any weight towards a final mark? Is that statement mm -hmm. true or is it false? There's a trend, trend again. 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 For the, the sake of time, time, let's get, get on to the, the next one. one. I, I will see the trend on this one. one. All right, so uh, stop posting for four. Number five, summative assessments are demonstrations of learning against all the outcomes in a course. Is the statement true or is it false?
Yeah, we're getting people split on that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, next, next one. one. All right, stop posting for five, six. Discussion among peers and guided groups and or individual work are examples of formative assessment. Discussion among peers and guided group and or individual work are examples of formative assessment. Is that statement true or is it false? Okay, I think the train's very clear on that one. Yes, yes the train, train is, is very clear. clear. Let's, Let's get, get on, on to the, the next one. one. Number seven. Students do not need feedback on formative assessment because it's not for marks. True or false? Okay, another yes, clear yes, trend for that one. Yes, it's a very, very clear, clear trend. trend. The last, last one. one. All right, so hold on for seven. We're now moving on to number eight. Summative assessments are more valid assessments because they carry a high weighting towards a final mark. They are, are there a more valid assessment is the statement. Okay, all right, Ephraim, I think you should talk okay. us through. Some of them are overwhelmingly the majority, and there are a few that were split. Yes, yes. And, and, and if, if we, we go, go to the next slide, and take the next, next two, two, I provide what, what I consider to be answers. I, um, I'm, I'm in, in the interest, interest of time, time. I'm, I'm not going to suggest, suggest that, that we read through, through them, them. But, but I do give the answer. answer. And, and I, I do, do give, give the explanation to the answer. So you, you might, might want, want to see which ones you got, got right and which ones, ones you got wrong. You probably, you probably might, might not agree, agree with, with me on some, some of them. So, so one, one was, was true. Okay, we go back. Yes. yes. All right. Okay. Sorry. Two, two was, was true. true. Three, Three was, was true. true. Four was, was false, and then five was, was false, six, six was, was true, seven was, was false, and then eight was, was false. You read it later. later. Uh, go, go through the, the, the reasons, reasons and then see if you agree. agree. Right. right. So, so colleagues, what, what are the implications for management? management? to this form of assessment that we are talking about. I think what is most important is for management to provide an enabling environment, institutional environment, for this authentic assessment to be implemented in an institution. And then I do highlight just three bullets there by way of example of that, that kind, kind of uh, facilitation. facilitation. Re providing relevant technological tools, for instance, including, including appropriate software, and, and ensuring, ensuring that, that there is sufficient staff, staff, staff to develop authentic assessment tasks that are appropriate for a program, uh, staff, staff to quality assure those assessment tasks before they, they go, go out to students. students. And, and for, for that, that to happen, happen you, you need actually to develop, to develop your, your staff, staff, to induct your staff, staff in these forms of assessment. And you also need to provide an appropriate policy environment, develop a policy on institutional policy on what you expect in terms of online assessment. So I think that's, in a nutshell, how best management can facilitate uh, authentic assessment to happen in an institution. 
let me let me hasten, however, to say that this is a this is a progressive way of assessing students, and you will meet with a whole lot of examples in that resource that I made reference to earlier on. The key thing, though, is you need to establish institutional preparedness to implement any particular form of e-assessment that you that you choose. Make sure you are ready to implement it. Whilst some of the approaches may be so good, if you are not ready as an institution, do not dare implement it because it will be disastrous. And in getting the institution ready to use any form of e-assessment that you choose, you must make sure that you have the right, you have the appropriate facilities and infrastructure. Like I say here, you have appropriate staff that has been appropriately, appropriately trained, but you must also prepare your students well in advance for any form of e-assessment that you want to adopt so that they, they become used to it. But yes, we need as an online delivery institution to settle for appropriate online assessment strategies, but they have to be authentic so our assessment processes can be credible enough. Thank you very much. I think this is what I thought I could share with you from the audit report on assessment processes. Again, Andrew, if there are any questions, maybe they could be posted in the chat space and I can respond to them even later on. Um, right, okay. Um, people, uh, getting both Ephraim and I into an hour was a bit of a squeeze. Um, but uh, again, the lecture itself is not the key piece. The key piece that we want you to do in order to um, get familiar with the um, process, let me just call up, I'm going to call it up on the screen in a minute. Let me make sure it's running. Here we go. Share, and I want to share. Hmm. Where's it gone? Sorry, so, so, dot, 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 dot. hang on. I've got everything but what I want to do, show all window. There we go. It's this one. Um, right. Oops, we've got all these goodies. Let me move them out the way. All right. So um, the, the little lecture was ready to stimulate some ideas. Um, the uh, Week two program is available for you on the ISCED Moodle server. Um, I'm, I am running behind. I started to look at the forum posts, but I haven't done them justice yet. I'm very excited that people are engaging. I think that's good. Um, and we've still got to have a look at the draft authentic assessment align, uh, assignment. Um, so um, please, if you haven't posted your assignment yet, please do so. Um, uh, Sorry, I, I'm, I'm the wrong week. Let me go back to last week. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm in the wrong week. I started to look at the two forums from last week, um, but um, I haven't done them justice yet. All right, so there wasn't an assignment last week. You just had to um, say your little say in the two forums. The first one was on the executive summary of um, the uh, and then uh, give your comments and then look at the open learning policy development guide and then give us what you think is relevant and pertinent to the ISCED. So we're still processing those. So we'll, um, yeah, we'll, we will alert you to what we think. Um, however, for this session, can you now please have a look at these three little activities? Um, there's about an hour's work here, uh, which we want you to do before Wednesday this, this time. The, we haven't got as long as previous. Um, we've got a little design for learning um, tutorial. So if you are interested in what I was talking about, you want to know a little bit more about learning design, then can you have a look at that? And then I'm going to I ask you a question about what you think about the learning design of the existing ISCED courses. Um, do you think they um, could be better in the future or what? Or do you feel that you're on a, a strong wicket already? So please let us know what um, 
uh, you think about that. Then we have um, a, a very nice site on the authentic assessment toolbox, right? So uh, if you're interested in what Ephraim was saying about making sure that it's not just a recall exam, but that the assessment is actually authentic, that it is what they are being tested on is what the outcomes of the course were. So can you have a look at that? And then there's a little, we want you to write it up a little bit and then uh, uh, send it to us uh, using the draft authentic assessment assignment upload facility. So we want you to give us your document. And then the third little activity is for you to have a look at um, uh, Another website is called Enhancing Assessment and Feedback with Technology. And um, then we would like you to know what you think are the challenges that your students are facing when it comes to e-assessment. So we can start thinking about how things maybe in the future need to be adjusted in terms of assessment. I notice in the chat, quite a number of you are already engaging now on what is uh, authentic assessment in our context. So I think that's uh, you're on the right track and you're thinking about the right things. Okay, enough yada yada from me. Um, if you would like to um, post um, uh, some more things in the chat, please do so. Or is there anyone who would like to raise their hand and have a say to the whole group at this point? Let me just have a look at my participants list again. It's over here. Uh, there is a question for Ephraim. I have been re uh, re recurrently asked the following question. How to deal mm -hmm. with the possibility that students are appropriately monitored during online exams? Which strategies can we use to minimize fraud in these cases? So Ephraim, I have That's an right. opinion on that, but what do you? Yes, there's the, the, it's, a common, it's a common question that is coming up every now and then. Each time you talk about um, e-assessment, that's what people will ask you. Um, of course, there is software now, different types of software actually, that you can use to proctor your students online. And that resource on that link in my slide will give you examples of such software. But also, um, the, the, what we are encouraging now to also prioritize formative assessment is, is one, one way, way of going around that problem. problem. Because, because even if, if one is to cheat at the terminal, terminal exam stage, if they don't pass the formative assessment, assessment they, will they will still not be able, able to pass. pass. Yeah. yeah. So, so the weighting of formative assessment is a the summative assessment, I think, becomes key in in, 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 in um, I'm also of the opinion that we've got to get away from trying to emulate an invigilated exam experience online. Um, the, the, we, they were never effective in the past in terms of measuring real learning. They were just really giving kudos to those people who could memorize stuff and then just dump it on the page. Yeah. Um, I think if you're going to go for authentic assessment, then that's much more powerful. So therefore, it wouldn't be one sit down, um, just dump it on the page type of exam. It would be a, a combination of opportunities for the students to demonstrate that they have acquired a proficiency or a competency, and that it would be almost like a little portfolio of evidence that they can achieve the course outcomes. So I think that would be a, um, a much more powerful summative assessment. Sadly, our our public um, have got into the belief that the, the big exam is the best way to evaluate learning. And to be honest, it is the worst way to do it. So mm. in many ways, I'm thinking you guys who now have to rethink assessment anyway, because you're going online, might as well go for the authentic assessment approach where you are yeah. um, really testing have people acquired competencies, proficiencies, yeah. and uh, can uh, apply knowledge rather than just memorize knowledge. So yeah, I would say you guys need to rethink the idea of trying to emulate a sit down invigilated exam online. As 
as Efren pointed out, there's now invigilation software, which kind of watches the student as they are doing it. So you get a film of them basically filling in their question paper. But I mean, that just seems to be going in completely the wrong direction. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, good question. Right. Any other questions? Uh, oh, we have one here from Dr. Kem Buzzer. I would like to know what is the best strategy for carrying out group work, facilitating time management, since in the work context, you should work as a team. All right. So um, I'll, I'll have a go at that one. And then Ephraim, you can chip in. Um, yeah. Now with these Zoom uh, synchronous sessions, we haven't used it yet, but there is a breakout room where you can put mm. people into smaller groups and then you can time them. You can say, all right, you've got 10 minutes to discuss item X and be ready then to present to the, uh, the class as a whole. So in some ways, uh, the fact that you are now online doesn't mean that you can't use groups. Okay, uh, facilitating time management. Well, they basically get kicked out of their little breakout room after the allocated time. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so may maybe. All right, and then on Moodle, it also does groups. So if you want, That's instead right. of working in a forum as the whole class, you can say, I want the forum to be done in groups. And then people would go in to their little group, uh, answer the question, and then other people can come and see what that group posted later on. So you've got some options. Uh, even though you're online, you can still do group work effectively. Uh, yeah, so a nice question. Uh, Ephraim, anything to add? Yes, just a little. And I, I completely agree. In, in learning management systems, you have the opportunity to put your students into groups so that they can work in groups. The challenge I find in most, most institutions is that merely creating that opportunity alone sometimes does not encourage every student to participate in a group work. So I think you will need to find ways of motivating your students to participate in some group activity so they learn uh, in teams. And one of the ways of doing that is to allocate some bit of marks to group work so that almost all your students will be motivated to participate in group work. I see Antonio says you can also use wikis, uh, which is a way of uh, organizing them into groups. So different groups would develop different wiki pages. So group one would be working on chapter one, group two on chapter two and so on. And then they put together a collaborative document. So that's a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. We've uh, Antonio mentions also that he has successfully used wikis. Uh, he uses PB Works. The challenge is how to get all students to participate. So I recommend right. a maximum of four students in a group, says Antonio. So nice advice. Okay. Uh, any any other observations? Um, I would like to in here. Uh, this, do I have a second? Okay. Um, it's about proper. Um, Salvation of or aspects. And I think that's to have all the others and what you said. Now we have all these proctoring software and other means to proctor exams. But one important thing we should note when we want to assess student must be on what I have used as my guideline the three pillars of assessment to be knowledge, application, and depth of understanding. If you base your assessment on these three pillars, it may not even be relevant to have a proctor for the exam. For example, in computer science, for example, most of my upper division courses I don't have the traditional sit down and write an exam. They are given a semester long project, which are assessed at every stage during the semester. So by the end of the semester, I will know whether the students really got the objectives of the course and understood or acquired any knowledge without putting them down for one hour 
two hours for an exam, which is something I personally don't believe in. And not alone getting a proctor to look at the um, seat and invigilate. So if we base our assessment on these three pillars, I think whether there is a proctor or no proctor, we can effectively assess um, our students. Martin, I'd strongly endorse that. Uh, if, if we can get away from this idea that um, we have to have a, you, you call them proctors, to yeah. uh, keep an eye on, on uh, the exam, then it's kind of defeating the project. The fact that mm -hmm. someone else could just take over their, their space uh, means that the exam isn't particularly useful because surely by now they would have demonstrated that they have a particular proficiency competency or the ability to apply a knowledge set. So, um, yeah, I think that's one way that the ISCED can then dif differentiate itself from other higher education institutions is by moving into this particular area of authentic assessment. And uh, if you can make a big fuss about that, then um, I think you'll, you'll make some waves. Um, thanks, Martin. Is there any other comments? We are run out of time. We're now uh, with 90 minutes. We did advertise 60 and we've uh, gone on for an extra half hour. All right. I'm looking for hands up. I'm looking for the chat. Okay, let's, let's close the synchronous session then. Um, as I say, the uh, training goes on. If you can then now find uh, allocate time before Wednesday morning to work through the, uh, the Moodle materials and engage with those that a little, uh, a little assignment and there's a little forum as well, if you can get involved with those. Um, this time I promise to be better. I've just been heading off crisis after crisis and I just haven't got in there. So now I will, you'll see me more. Someone in the chat mentioned transactional distance and I'm afraid my transactional distance has been a disaster. So I'm feeling I've abandoned you. So um, now I need to uh, get in there. I'm wanting to see all of you in there as well. I want you to experience what it is like to be online and uh, to have to work there. So well done, people. I think that's the synchronous session done. Please, can you move on to the Moodle section? Next session is early. It's Wednesday. We're back on Wednesdays again, and we will stay on Wednesdays, 9 o'clock to just after 10. The slower you come in, the more it drags on. So um, if you can be there promptly at 9 on Wednesday morning, I will send out another Zoom link. We, we like to keep the security tight because we got hacked at the AAU. So we're a little bit paranoid about security. Oh. Um, so um, that's why I'll send out a new link for each uh, session uh, the night before so that you're ready for the morning. Okay. Um, any other issues? People are saying thanks in the, in the chat. Good, all right. Um, uh, you're free to go. You can leave. I'll stay on a little bit longer just to engage with people um, after the session. I'm going to stop the recording now and um, the recording will be available in the uh, course for those people who'd like to either revise or hear a section again, um, or if people uh, missed it altogether, we can always point them to that recording. Okay, thank you very much. We are done.